It's a pleasure to be here today and get this opportunity to talk with Mick on uh, some of the work we've done around uh, continuous visibility across the life cycle. So um, I'll start off talking a little bit about sort of uh, nationwide transformation. We started almost 10 years ago with a focus on doing agile at scale. And then we started with a few lines and it really was an experiment to see if we could actually do this across an organization uh, which has over 5,000 um, associates and, and another you know, few thousand uh, folks that work with us as uh, and and it was successful right we went from a few lines to today well over 200 lines and we are committed to 100 percent of our work in agile and so you know uh, we got some great results from that but if you took a step back and looked at the value stream we kind of had this water scrum fall thing going on in the sense that in the middle of the process where the agile work was being done and a card entered the back log and went all the way through uh, a set of iterations, we went we had high velocity. But once we were done with those iterations, we weren't going obviously straight into production. There was a lot of manual activities and other things occurring that was increasing our, our lead time. And if you looked upstream in the process, we also had an issue continuously flowing work to our teams. Um, many teams, if you went to them and said, why can't you go faster? It's basically they're waiting for something, right? They're either waiting for work to come to them, they're waiting for another team to develop something that they need, or they're waiting for an environment or something. So, so the challenge is how do we sustain this acceleration across the value stream? Um, so if you look at um, sort of you know, what are the inhibitors to really lean deliver, right? So if you take a step back and you start to do some value stream analysis, you find out that, well, it's hard. We know automation brings speed, but one thing that impedes that is variation. If, if you can't automate something unless you have a pattern, and you can't create a pattern unless you reduce variation. So, you know, we had variation in terms of our work intake process. We had variation in terms of you know, our, our release and deployment processes. Um, so that was an issue. So, you know, I talked a little bit already about our, our dependencies and wait states. Um, you know, the fact that we still do annual planning, which is probably not unique, also doesn't sometimes impede work to flow. Um, but, you know, what I really want to focus on is, is the lack of visibility. And sometimes I, I use analogies of driving a car, right? If you're driving a car and, you know, it's foggy or you're not familiar with the road or you don't trust the car, or if you're teaching a teenager to drive, you may not have an ultimate trust in them, you know, your first reaction is going to be slow down because you're not sure what's coming up. And so, and so, you know, I think the assertion that we're sort of making today is that, is that one of the methods to go fast is you need to have more visibility to what's going on in your value stream. Um, so how do we address that? Um, so I think if, if you looked at um, where we were in terms of um, you know, our DevOps model, we use this model of a house. And it's kind of built on Gene Kim's three ways around flow and feedback loops and experimentation and our true north is reduce lead time for changes so we can enable you know business enabling responsiveness so if you look at the practices they probably aren't going to look um, that unfamiliar to you there are things like version control everything automated testing continuous integration automated infrastructure continuous delivery and monitoring things and some of these you know we were more mature at and some of those we're still working on but then there's the whole aspect of culture, right? And that's where you get into these things around reducing variation and, and you know, how can you really empower people to do things in a more self-service way um, so that you don't have in your value stream a lot of SLAs around requests, you know, responses. Anything in your value stream where you have to wait for an environment or wait 
for somebody else to do something, you know, it's going to create as a, a form of waste. It's a waste state that you can you should try to address and automate, you know, through some kind of self service. But again, a lot of these things come down to stopping or waiting because you have different views. People have different views of where the work is based on where you are in the value stream. So that's kind of where we addressed it, you know, working with Mick to see how is it that we can show, shed more light on what's happening in the value stream. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about is a lot of DevOps is around technology. And, and you know, I think it's, it's more than technology, right? Where we sort of are stuck in many companies that are stuck is in the left-hand side of this, which is the vicious cycle, right? So you have large bat sizes, which leads you to complex releases, and that leads to long release times. And in some cases, they may be time-based releases, right? You have like a monthly release window or something. You have some change windows that are time-based. So even if, even if something's ready, it doesn't go until you've reached that time because you have to go through all these manual checklists and make sure that, you know, nothing is going to go wrong if you, if you release this set of application code into production. Where we want to get to is really this readiness-based release where we're driving more smaller batch sizes, simpler releases, you know, which will lead us to, to shorter lead times. So, so what's one of our mechanic, what's one of the ways we're going to do that? So, um, one of the things that we're going to do from that perspective um, is to, uh, you know, shed some light about what's happening as we go through um, our value stream. So, so what was kind of our legacy state if you actually looked at our processes and tooling? You know, it was a disparate set of processes and tooling starting with release planning. So, so we have a tool that we were doing planning, portfolio planning, um, and that's where we're doing a lot of, of planning of work. Um, and so the project manager or the person managing the initiative had their own view of the work, right? Then, then once our agile process is kicked in and we started to flow stories through our agile lines, we had a very good visual system management view around that. So if you went up to, a, a, you know, we have open team spaces with team seating. If you went up to their visual management board, you could see what's in the backlog, what your work in progress was, you know, what's done. You could see their blockers. So everything was good, except that the backlog of the team was not attached. You couldn't really see the association with the portfolio, right? It was like the cards just were like, up here, right? How did they actually get here? What's the relationship to the portfolio? How do you really relate that work? And then once the iterations were done, you know, the code again wasn't going into production, right? So we then had another set of tooling and activities around our custom release management tool. So release managers and sometimes we're replicating or duplicating work and doing manual entry into another system for their model of the work, right? And then and then when you got the Carmen, I'm not sure if you can hear me that you seem to have frozen up. Uh, Mick, are you there? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump you. in right now and hopefully Carmen gets back to us soon. Um, okay. But yeah, I think you know one thing that's that's just been absolutely fascinating with Nationwide, and I've seen you know, some of the largest agile, enterprise agile and DevOps transformations out there is is just how much effort they put into some of these core things that we care about with DevOps. Uh, they're, they're just not easy. Um, so at scale, connecting the work intake systems, make sh making sure you've got some kind of flow, and you know through this, all the work that they did, if you you know you walk through their floors, making that work visible, where everything is up on boards, everything is, is within their backlogs. But the challenge they had with connecting these things, and I think that's kind of where I'll jump in right now, and then we can get Carmen to take us back into how it happened. But you know what's fascinating is that. A lot of organizations out there know that they want, you know, they want to succeed with a DevOps transformation. They want to, you know, succeed with becoming more agile, getting to continuous delivery, and so on. But it's just been very hard, and they've got they see pockets within the organizations that are doing it right. It's been very difficult to scale, and you really need to take that organizational approach that we've seen nationwide take to go away from the reality that we see at almost every large IT shop on the planet today, which is that everything's are dis everything is disconnected. The work 
intake systems are not tracked or connected or linked, <clears throat> and there's just no way to measure where you are and how much business value is being delivered through this transformation. You can easily measure how quickly people are complete, completing user stories. You have no idea, if you go think back to the commerce diagram, how, could, how quickly uh, things flowed all the way from a business initiative, um, a funded project, a new application, into that being in the hands of customers and, and users. So there's just this big disconnect in, in the reality. And a big part of that disconnect is, is that the tool chains themselves have become disaggregated. Uh, is, is that as DevOps and Agile tools have moved in, the tools have become very specialized. And so just an example from another organization, uh, every line of business in this case, every department and business unit had their own tool chain. They were in various stages of Agile maturity. And none of this was possible to connect. So we've got kind of two layers or two dimensions of heterogeneity happening, wrecking havoc here. One is across lines of business and business units where you know, the design, the business analysis might happen in different requirements management tools, for example, or in this case, even in different development tools because one business unit is, is on a .NET stack, another one's on Java, one's in the Microsoft tool, one is, one is in a, uh, one's using a rational team concept here. So um, what we've got is that kind of heterogeneity, but then the thing that Carmen showed before as well is heterogeneity as the work progresses through the value stream as well. So all the way from a funded project and a PPM tool, to the development work being done, to you know, to it moving through the pipeline into QA and automation, and the net result of this is that as organizations have tried to look at how to connect their value streams, there's just been a ton of manual waste and duplicate entry, and that can't scale. You can get that to work in pockets. You can get to work with 50 IT staff, maybe 100 if you're lucky. You just can't scale it. So just jumping into this, and I think we've got coming back, uh, so we'll get into to jumping into this portion soon. I'll just run through this a little bit further. Um, you know, we need to you know, build on those, uh, you know, the three ways that, that we all learned from the Phoenix Project and Gene Kim of a flow of amplifying feedback loops and, conti and continuing learning and experimentation and create some kind of infrastructure, a value stream infrastructure that can support that. So I think Nationwide's done an amazing job on the culture and transformation side by making that a core business priority. That's the only way any of this will happen. That's stuff on the right of this DevOps house. Um, and where we've really partnered is to create an infrastructure, a tooling environment that can actually support that, these flows of information where you can actually monitor everything. Uh, you can get continuous delivery, you, everything's automated, and workflows across the value stream, across these best repeat systems in whatever way you've com combined them, wherever you're in your transformation. Um, across your different lines of development. And so really, you know, taking a slightly more abstract view of the problem, this diagram, you know, this, is, this is how we've learned to look at it with our customers, is that you've got these different roles, that you'll have slightly different names for them in your organizations. Um, you've got tooling in each of these boxes where you, know, you might have, well, I know organizations with five or six different Agile tools. It's not a great idea, you should have one. If you're doing .NET, you'll probably end up with Microsoft's Visual Studio Online or TFS. Um, so one or two, but you want to kind of standardize on tools as much as possible, but the, the key thing is you then need things to flow across this. However, you've mapped out your value stream, and I think one of the coolest things we'll see from Carmen is exactly how Nationwide's done it, and then make sure that things can flow. And then make sure that you can measure that flow, because in the end, what we're really after is, is maximizing the flow, looking at where the constraints are. Too often, IT leaders react to the fact that constraints are in development, um, and just hire more developers, and yet you're now six to 12 months down the road, there's no more excuse that the development teams are not ramped up, but there's not more business value being delivered. And maybe you didn't even know how to measure business value del delivery in the first place. So really taking this value stream-centric look at the problem, and looking how we integrate the flows across this value stream, and then how we get continuous visibility across it, um, is, is really how we're looking at it. So um, Carmen, I think I'll just jump back and can you speak right now, Carmen? Because I think we'll jump back to you right yeah. now, and then I'll hop into I think, things. I think really, yeah, I think it's actually, I appreciate it. Sorry, I'm not sure. Must have walked. Gremlins in my internet. So I think you can go to the next slide, which actually had the value stream um, that we were talking about. So so we came up with, you know, a concept of the world. What was our integrated value stream, right? And, and this is a, obviously a high-level view, but I think it starts to allow us to talk about things even to the point where we're starting to talk about the colors, right? About, well, is this in the orange part or the red part or the green part of the value stream? So, so the orange, you know, when we look at lead time, we really are looking at the concept of there's, there's an idea or as Mark Schwartz would say, a hypothesis, right, of something that can add value. 
and and how do you then you know accelerate or, or the lead time shorten the lead time from that to where you're actually getting on monitoring and feedback from the user of was that hypothesis correct or not so so you know the orange part is really around that planning part so so it's really you know flowing that work you know it's sort of these MVP concepts right of what's my minimal viable product let's get it going and, and let's flow that work into the into the team so that they can uh, from a product you know kind of a product centric perspective you know have them work on what we think are our ideas of what we think can drive more value then as we said we have the red part pretty well you know that's the part that was actually going pretty well in terms of our agile model but then we've changed this the green part from a certification perspective to be readiness based so we really want to say as soon as this is ready as soon as it's received all its certifications right in terms of quality security performance you know your, your user acceptance testing as soon as you you know capital one i think when you hear topo talks they have like a 16-day process we have something around nine or ten qualities you know readiness certifications once you have those you really want to be able to deploy and you want to make that as self-service as possible right so you want to you want to now empower the teams you know give them the visibility and empower them to actually drive through the certifications and, and then once the sort of once you have that snapshot a version of that code that's ready to go right you should be able to deploy that now sometimes you still have to wait for a, a nightly change window or something maybe you're doing zero downtime maybe you can do dark launches i mean it's all about reducing dependencies to allow you to go more frequently into production and, and eliminate the wait states that we currently have in our process so if you go to the next slide that really you know what does this actually look like from then a tooling perspective well you know starting i always talk back to the phoenix project and say well there's four types of work right there's business value work there's changes there's operational work and then there was the one that took them long to figure out which was on plan work so if you kind of map that into what that means for us our business value work comes from our portfolio planning system which is clarity you know kind of our unplanned work comes from quality center and then kind of our changes in operation work come from service now so you know we use task top then what you really want to have and i think nick was maybe it was talking about this if not i'm sure you will was kind of a loosely coupled tool architecture right so that you're you're you really can can get a best of breed solution and you can kind of plug and play now you know, I can't say we can, we're to the point where we can just unplug one of these and plug them back in, but that's kind of the idea is, is to use TaskTalk to provide that integration capability and have those APIs that then can feed information into the delivery pipeline. So then it goes into Rational Team Concert where we do both our release planning work and our agile visual system management work. So we're taking advantage of both those things in RTC and then, and then these concepts of initiatives and changes flow downstream into urban code release. So now I can see at the enterprise level, which is what we couldn't see before, we have like 20, 21 business areas, I can now see a consolidated view of initiatives and changes. Sometimes it's kind of ugly because it, it, shows it, it, it shows in your face how complicated things are, right? We, we were just looking at one yesterday for a release in January, and one application was making, you know, had changes in 13 different initiatives. So you can imagine if that application ran into problems in terms of being able to be released, not only is it going to impact 13 initiatives, but each one of those initiatives have other applications that are making changes. Some of those applications have changes in multiple initiatives. So there's a cascade effect here that could really impact you know, a large amount of what you're trying to do with that release. Um, and this kind of shows you all that. And this will also then show you if you're actually making progress, back to the vicious cycle slide I showed, where you're going into larger, smaller batch sizes and less dependencies. Well, this whole matrix of dependencies then, this, this, this analysis view, 
will shrink and that will be a visual representation now mix mix gonna probably talk about other metrics right that you can you can start to apply here in terms of you know their state of the devops metrics but we think there's probably other metrics that that are kind of leading indicators to that like bad size and and some of the things with your source code system and things like that but but you know that's that's something visual now that you can see so now you can sort of have the representation of what's in the code and then when you when you integrate with ucd you actually can see your pipeline many times systems didn't even have a visible pipeline of how they were going to production and they were all doing it differently and they talked about things being different so now again we've driven out some of that variation with this idea of certifications and we really don't care what environment you get a certification in um it's it's just around getting those certifications through your pipeline to the point where you have something that has all the certifications um you know and some of those our goal is to automate all those but for now even if you're starting out ma with manual granting of certain certifications that's fine at least you have the visibility you have the visibility then then at least now you can see the road you can you know you feel more confident in the car and you can start to try to drive faster right without that trying to drive faster would be would be reckless right and then of course you know those certification results again we're working to you know task off is probably going to play a role here too is to do we actually have uh, a system of record for these you know can we automate you know the certification and then and then obviously once you deploy right and we're you know we're using tools like new relic now you know you also have an integration between ucd and new relic that gives you you know a data point about a deployment and you can monitor that and get that feedback so so this is kind of the the realization of that integrated value stream that we talked about um and you know we're at the point now where we're ready to actually run experiments in the next year just to see how fast we can go which is exciting but that brings up another point which it's on the next slide right which is well if i'm actually going to take this to heart and run experiments well then i'm going to go through the Schuhart cycle the deming principles right plan do check act John Willis would be happy if he was listening to this because John Willis, if you've ever heard him, is a big Deming. He knows everything about Deming. It's amazing if you ever get to hear him talk about anything, but his Deming talks are really great. Um, so, you know, you can now, if, if we're really going to go faster, well, do we even have a baseline to measure this? And the reality is, I think, and, and Nick is more of an expert on this than I am, I think the answer for most enterprises is no. Right? At best, they're trying to measure lead time as code commit to code deploy, but as we talked about, that's only part of the value stream. Right? There's this whole orange, orange part, and how are you flowing work, and that's all going to get into it if, if you really want to minimize how long it takes you to do that hypothesis testing. So if you kind of look at what this gives us, a byproduct of doing this integration and the visibility is, you know, you have your value stream that we sort of showed, work intake, you know, the release, release the agile work, and then the certification. If you look a little deeper, it sort of shows this process, right? Where we have an initiative, we have the changes, they, they're, they're scheduled for release. You have the code actually being built through your source code management, you know, Git, you're doing CI, it's being deposited in the code station of UCD, and then you're moving through your certification process. Again, all this is now visible in the tooling, and then you deem ready for production to where you do deploy. Well, now, since you have all this and you have task talk integration, you know, you actually have now a method of starting to measure this within the tooling and things that would have been very hard before, right? You would have had to go in a number of different tools and and manually or somehow I'll try to figure out how you're gonna take this information. Well, now, it, it not only do you get this, but you know I think it actually sort of um, gives you more visibility to your value stream and how long things are taking. So in this example, which is just an illustration, it's not real, you know, it's, we, we just, it's 132 days. So, you know, on June 1st, the chain was, change was created, which means essentially the business 
gave us the go-ahead that we want to do something, right? And this is just, we're just now following the life cycle of one application change for this initiative. It could have more than one change, especially in this world of large, larger batch sizes. But one change, if you can't get good at doing one change, obviously that's where you have to start. So, you know, it goes into the backlog. It, it may take some time to become work in progress and done. Right, then you start to deploy into environments where you're trying to get your certifications. Obviously, that might be an iterative process, right? Because you know, you're eventually though you're getting your quality certifications and you mark it ready for production. Now, in this case, even then, there's like a three-week delay because this is sort of demonstrating a monthly change window. And if I'm, even if I'm done on September 22nd, if the change window is next change window is until October 10th, the code's just gonna sit there for three weeks. My branch, if I had to take a release branch and get it sitting there for another three weeks, right? All this kind of stuff is is gonna slow down the process because you know we know that if you can't work from the trunk and merge into the trunk, that just makes everything harder to do from a development perspective. So, you know, this gives us a this would give us a visualization then of under, you know how long did it take and you know why do why was why were we done from 612 we didn't do a first deploy into an environment until 81 and we didn't do a quality certification until 93 right that would raise those questions here that you may not have thought about right you may think as Mick said well I'm just gonna have more developers or I'm gonna do this or I'm gonna do that and in fact as we know from the theory of constraints right if you don't focus on the bottleneck. If you, if you improve something before the bottleneck, you just create more inventory at the bottleneck. And if you improve something after the bottleneck, then then those processes afterwards are just, they have idle time, which is a form of waste, right? Because wasting people's time having resources sit idle is a form of waste. So, so I think at times, you know, we're, we're, we're making educated guesses, but it's not really based on data. It's based on anecdotal stories. And, and what this allows us to do is, is bring the data and the visualization to focus on where we really are spending our time and how can we accelerate for it. I think that might be my last slide. Yeah, and I think, so, I think for me and I think for, for others who have not yet taken their own internal tool chains and value streams and process models to, you know, to this level, I think the, you know the most important takeaway from this talk, and the most important things that I've taken away from from the Carmen team event nationwide, is just how important it is you know to, to go through these three steps. And so, if you're going to do anything after I think after this after this webinar, it's to make sure that either you or someone within your organization has this kind of decomposition of your value stream at this more abstract process that you know this really is your business process around around delivering software. Um, on a diagram and visible. I think you know, one of the, the ways that Carmen inspired me way early on is by, by throwing this book at me, the, the Learning to See book on value stream mapping. And you know, this is how manufacturing got control of their quality, of their lead times, and of finding their bottlenecks in an extremely, you know, the extremely complex process of manufacturing physical goods. We're now at the same scale where just implementing continuous delivery is not enough. Um, because again, you, your bottleneck might not be that. Your bottleneck might be that things are just sitting forever and these feature branches are not going to trunk and you just don't know because then you don't know how th this actually varies across the different development teams that you've got and the different lines. So I think I, I just challenge everyone to do what Nationwide has done here and break it out in PowerPoint and Visio, wherever you're gonna do it at this more abstract process level, at this tool level because in the end, I think what we need to do, we understand, you know, you've already got some kind of business process around delivering software implemented. It's more waterfall than you want and you want it to be more end-to-end -end agile. But in the end, it's, it's implemented across these tools. And um, as Carmen alluded to, I think it's critical as we, you know, we create these tool chains uh, that these tool chains are implementing the value stream and they're adapting to it. Because for a lot of organizations, the work intake systems change. So you might be, you know, Nationwide's got a, a great thing going with RTC and UCR and UCD here, but what if there's a new business or new acquisitions made and they're actually tracking um, their, their service desk, their operational 
uh, another work is is actually coming from from a different system, right? It's coming from another service that's coming from a legacy tool. All of that needs to flow in here, needs to flow into this value stream. And you know, we've actually worked with a number of customers who have three different work intake systems from the ITL and ITSM side, where where there's one here of ServiceNow as things evolve in that tool chain. Again, they're best of breed PPM tools coming right now that are more oriented towards agile than some of the ones that we're using and all of this. Even, you know, even Quality Center over here, uh, HP has released Octane, the modern version of that tool. You might end up with two work and systems. On the quality side, you might, might end up with a lot more automation. So really, the shift of thinking uh, of there being one development platform, this one end-to-end -end platform has transformed dramatically, right? You might be using Rational Quality Manager. Those are now two different tools that information has to flow the right way into RTC and show up in this monitoring and feedback. So it's time to start thinking in this modular way about the tool chain that implements your value stream. And the only way to do that is, is to make it visible, is to be communicating with your colleagues, with your different tool owners, with your IT leaders around it in exactly this way so that you can actually start at a very high level uh, to look at optimizing it. Because I think one of the I think most powerful things that, this, that, that uh, I keeps ringing in my head when I do customer visits that, that Carmen said, and I'm listening to, to where they are in their transformations, this was Carmen at uh, DevOps Enterprise Summit a, a year ago, um, was that you know, these deployments at most organizations of Agile and DevOps are just local optimizations. So they're just local optimizations of the value stream where you've taken out bottlenecks to help developers you know, work really effectively and plan and move things off their backlog and start working on the feature branch. Um, that can be very deceptive at how well that's working because again, if you look end to end and your bottleneck is further upstream, uh, in the design phase and communicating with your business partners, um, communicating, you know, getting getting that work funded, getting those activities done, the orange stuff over here, it might not matter. Um, it might not actually give you any additional velocity. And I, it, what blows my mind is just the number of large, very well funded transformations I've seen where the velocities decreased for reasons people don't understand. And the reason the reason that's happened is because they've taken. This is fascinating. They've taken you know something that used to be a nine-month waterfall process. So I'll tell a story of a of a of a you know top ten World Bank quickly here. Uh, a nine-month waterfall process. You heard Carmen talking about the kind of manual certifications and checklists. Uh, this organization was doing those once every nine months, and they went agile. Uh, so now they're doing them once every four weeks, and they take five days <laughs> for every person. So and this is not funny at all to me because they're now, you know, this is, this is the amount of economic waste this is causing at this very large organization with thousands of developers who've moved on to this new tool chain. 25% of the developers, business analysts, and testers time now, and operations people time, uh, slightly less, is, is non-value added work of running all of those manual things. So you can't even go through your transformation until you've actually, um, map this out and predicted where some of the bottlenecks will be. You know, one of the ones that was a real surprise to us at TaskDog is once we got four or five years ago, we just got, we created a very rigorous culture of code review, but then we hired a bunch of more junior developers straight out of the, the University of British Columbia here, and we noticed we had so much stuff sitting in feature branches, not moving to trunk. Uh, and we noticed this through looking at our value stream. No one predicted this, uh, that we just did not have enough senior uh, engineers dedicated to code review for the more junior staff. So we ended up, and I think Carmen's image for this is perfect, it's ended up with this huge inventory of feature branches that were taking you know, two release cycles, and sorry, I mean two sprints, so, so four weeks to, you know, to get to trunk. And, and that's not how we develop at all. We're, you know, we've always been around uh, making sure our mean time to resolution is, is very short and feature delivery um, lead time is very short as well. So it really is, again, a challenge you to break out your world, your tool chain, your value stream, and your, and your processes into these diagrams, and then look at, you know, start looking at where the bottlenecks are, and it's, it's really then becomes about two things. One is about this flow, on the flow of these things, so that it's, you know, it, it's not going to work at the velocity that you want until it's automated, and then of course, once you've got that flow connected, then you can actually get the visibility. You can start looking into these things, and of course, we, we we've partnered with Nationwide on this by getting you know TaskTop Sync and Gateway connecting the flows, and TaskTop Data for getting that visibility. But however you do it, just make sure as a first step, map this out, map out the stages, and you'll actually start you know as soon as those conversations start, you'll start thinking the right way about end-to-end -end results, not results in one silo, not results in I mean, developers closing user stories faster. Just because they're closing faster doesn't mean that you, you know, your results as a business will be better. And in the end, I think that's, that's that real shift of focus. Instead of 
localized metrics on, you know, they're, sorry, these are very important leading indicators, I should say, how often can we deploy? That, that's absolutely critical. But you can be deploying, you know, you can have set up an infrastructure for deploying daily, and if your backlog's further upstream, it doesn't really deliver much more because there's not much more that you're able to push through that into your value stream. So really taking a look at what, exactly what, what Nationwide has done here of the end-to-end -end metrics, which are around results. They're not around handoffs in the value stream, they're around, they're around results. So what is my lead time? What is my mean time to resolution? So when a defect comes in, when you've got something that came from ServiceNow as a ticket, how long did, did that take to flow through this thing? And as soon as you start thinking about the end-to-end -end things, you'll start focusing in on, uh, very quickly, the right leading indicators for bottlenecks between the different stages in your value stream, such as the issue we had with, with things sitting in feature branches for too long. Or you know, another issue you might have with you know, your deployment uh, checkpoints or security uh, certifications you know, being the bottleneck. But it's really taking that end-to-end -end view that we've seen Nationwide do here, which is ex exactly the right approach to this. So, yeah, my, hey, my Mick, Mick, I need, Mick, I need the speaker for a minute. Can you speak a little bit closer to your microphone? Some of the attendees are having difficulty hearing you. So I appreciate that, thanks. And, and can I ask a question real quickly? There, you referenced the book. Uh, can you um, let us know what that is again? Yeah, I am there holding it up. Carmen gave this to me when I visited Nationwide once. I don't think there's an ebook of this, so I just I, I keep it with me close by at all times. It's called Learning to See. And I think one thing that we're seeing, we're actually, is Nationwide's demonstrating to us here, is that we're learning to see in the software delivery process. It was very easy. It's very easy if you, you know, see any of the charts I like showing, which have car plants on them and really cool you know, BMWs moving down the factory line. It's easy to see physical goods moving through a factory line. It's very easy to see IT work. And again, the stuff that Nationwide's done to make it visible across their, their boards and their rooms is critical, but we now make it, need, need to make it visible in a scalable way across these tools and across this kind of complexity, and, and this is how you approach that. So really, it's, you know, we need to learn how to see software production, and, and I think and Nationwide's onto something here. So. And what I'll do, attendees, is I'm gonna, on my follow-up email, I'm gonna include the ISBN number. So Mick, if you can provide that to me sometime today, that would be fantastic. And uh, that'll be included in the follow-up email for everybody. So okay. Sorry for the interruption. No problem, yeah, any, no problem, I'll, I will do just that. So I'll dive, uh, Carmen, any more comment there before I dive into a little bit of how uh, we approach this? Uh, the only comment I was gonna make is you were talking about flow and so, you know, my my uh, manager, Tom Payer, uh, who also wrote a book with Mike Orson uh, called Lean IT Field Guide, um, would joke around, you know, why do we want to see things flow? And and the answer is you want to see where they stop, right? And and that's exactly, you know, I think what Mick was just talking about, right? It, it's hard to know, right? I mean, you can visually start to see these like you can obviously in a manufacturing car plant or whatever, um, you can start to see that, then you can see where things actually stop, slow down, pile up, right? And then you can start to address them based on data rather than anecdotes, because the anecdotes are, are you chase, you're gonna chase the anecdotes into a series of local optimizations. Um, and I think, um, you know, that's where applying these principles to what you're trying, what you're doing from a software delivery perspective is so critical. Yeah, exactly. And I think we're at the point right now where the amount of waste from these local optimizations or these anecdotally guided, not, not data-driven initiatives, are it, it, it means that so much of IT spend at so many organizations is actually going, organizations going into waste. Uh, we're just opening the door for disrupt, you know, to disruption and to competitors who've actually figured this out or are much smaller and it's been much easier for them to create this value stream are, are moving in. So it's, I actually think the, the ability of organizations to do what Nationwide's done here is what's going to de determine their competitiveness and the success of their digital transformations in the future, which is why you know, this, is, this is a topic that's, that's so near and dear to us. And that book as well, we should send out, the, the Lean IT Field Guide. Um, you know, I read that, it's a, it, it's a great book. Um, by Thomas Bader. Um, so th that speaks a lot to this. So I'm just going to jump forward here and, and just look at and share with you one of my other inspirations of how we do these things because you know we had a similar problem with, with software way back um, where 
uh, actually, you know, Eric Gamma, uh, who was my, on my PhD thesis committee, I think put out this, this great n idea out there that he got inspired by uh, Christopher Alexander on. And Christopher Alexander was create these pattern languages for us to build cities and buildings and, and basically lay out uh, something that's very complicated, which is you know, how we construct everything today. Um, and created a pattern language for that on where doors should go or where uh, a, a square should go so that you had a you know, very active social area within a city uh, that also drove commerce and so on. So Eric kind of raised this notion of abstraction to design patterns, Eric and, and team here, um, with his design patterns. And they created these kind of higher level interactions between the modules that, that, you know, that form the architecture of our software systems today. And so you know, I just kept scratching my head, you know, how do we do this for uh, software delivery, not for software you know, construction and architecture and coding, but, but for the value stream? How do we you know, just bring a common language to emulate the stuff that, that Carmen and Tom and team have done at Nationwide and make it more reproducible? And so we've really started looking at it this way. This, this is still evolving and a work in progress. But you know, in the end, you, you, you've got a value stream that you need. And then you've got these process frameworks. And the process frameworks, you know, they, they could have come from consultants. They could have come from great thought leaders. You've got SAFE and DAD and Nexus and so on. Uh, things basically replacing waterfall, but you know, maintaining the discipline of, of requirements management. Um, so you've got these process frameworks, which, come, which, which are continuing to evolve. And then at the bottom, you've got these lifecycle tools. And basically, we've come up with this set of integration patterns you know, for achieving two things. And Carmen you know, said exactly what it is. It's really for achieving flow across the value stream. And then as soon as you've got that flow, of course, you can get that visibility. So here are just some examples of the sorts of things that, that we've deployed um, and nationwide, things like defect unification. And in the end, this really is about connecting uh, work intake with where the work is being done and making sure that you've got an automated flow. You don't have people logging into three tools or filling out reports or, or basically passing defects or tickets or security vulnerabilities with a spreadsheet, which again, piles up inventories. Uh, it can't be properly governed and just can't, you can't get that to work at the pace that, that you're trying with your transformation. You know, things like requirements traceability to make sure what you ship, how are you going to measure, you know, what features, what user stories are actually in production and running if you don't have traceability across your value stream um, and orchestrating your plans and so on. And you know, to the point where this actually needs to stretch out into your software suppliers. If, if you've outsourced some of your software delivery or QA, any of that, you actually now need to have that same value stream visibility the same way that you have supply chain visibility in manufacturing. So uh, what we've really been focused on is be, you know, basically ensuring we connect these things and you're always working out of some kind of process uh, implementation or legacy, whether it's you know, PMBOK, you're deploying safe today, you still have ITIL. It's really a question of how we connect these things because in the end, any one of those process methodologies, so here we've got the scaled agile framework, um, are a connection of these patterns of flows uh, where you need to connect executive planning to project definition, for example, um, or you need to connect requirements to test visibility and do that even differently if you've got on made testing with Selenium and WebDriver and so on. So it's really, again, I think the right way to approach this is to break it out in Visio and PowerPoint, wherever, the way Karma did at the start of this talk, and start thinking about those flows and how we connect up those flows into these, into these kinds of patterns. And then once you've done that, it's actually much easier to get down to the technical level of the art actual artifacts that flow uh, that really are the anchors for the, you know, the work being done. They're, they are the, the, you know, the units, the containers for the business value that you're delivering. For example, you might have, this is another organization's um, stack, but basically features going in business epics, turning into um, features in DNG um, that are then worked on in RTC, a combination of RTC Bluemix, and in this case, it's like a few teams using Jira as well. But all of that can be connected, and this organization actually you know, sees this end-to-end -end flow of their value stream the one that, made, that Carmen connected, even though they've got a very different tool chain. And even though they've got you know, some green focus projects, they're using Bluemix, those projects can grow up very quickly because they get that requirements traceability. They get connected to the work and take systems once they go live uh, that are coming in this case from BMC Remedy, problems and incidents, that work and take can go straight to them. And so really that's what we've been very focused on is making sure that you've got the integration infrastructure, the value stream integration infrastructure to make all these flows work. But of course, the first place to start is defining those processes and flows and you know, then ending up with something like this. And this is where um, our teams at, at TaskUp and help you create these software lifecycle architecture diagrams, which we realize are just turning into these technical portions of the, um, of the value stream diagrams that you saw. 
But again, it's really the combination of this, and I think what Carmen's done a very unique job on here, which is actually defining the value stream, the process stream, and the way that that then gets implemented in terms of these process model transitions that happen to transition across tools. And it's those transitions across tools where, where tools like TaskTop can help. So, you know, the end goal here, of course, is however you lay out your infrastructures that you've got flow across these things, whatever the tools are, um, you've got the right combination of integration technologies because in the end, there are a lot of these different ones. Some data you want to synchronize. In some cases, especially when you've got the CLM tools, you can actually, we can actually leverage OSLC, which is why TaskTop supports OSLC. In some of the newer tools, you actually get to leverage webhook technologies as well, this very lightweight and unstructured integration, um, so that you can get these integration patterns across your value stream, such as requirements, traceability, um, defect unification, and so on. And make sure that you're implementing the process frameworks that, that you've decided on, be that safe, um, your DevOps transformations, you know, your existing ITIL implementation. But whatever that is, whatever your landscape here is, the key thing that, that we're trying to get across is that you need continuous visibility into that because otherwise you're not going to know where to prioritize the transformation work. Whether again, you need more developers or you need more senior developers doing code reviews faster to get things into the trunk or you know, to do more automation on the deployment side. And you know, we only, it, it, you know, again, Carmen referred to the theory of constraints. I think each of us needs to, you know, that, that is the absolute key way to think about this. If you're not focused on the constraint in your value stream, uh, you're wasting your time. So, Carmen? Thanks, Vic. So, you know, in the end, right, it, this just kind of shows again what, what you know, we can get out of this, right? So. So one of the things, right, is delivery opportunity. So that might not be something that comes to mind, but I think once you start to connect your portfolio to the backlog of your agile teams, they actually can see, is there opportunities to actually, you know, you really want a pool model from a lean concept all the way through. So if you start to build that integrated, port integrated portfolio around product-centric, high-priority work, or at least priority from the perspective of the things that you want to you know, run your experiment on, um, the team can then pull those in and that, you know, that addresses a lot of flow issues. A lot of times what we saw was at points in the year, our teams really, the work just dried up and then at other points, it was an avalanche of work. Well, you know, if we just keep flowing work, you know, around that integrated product backlog, you can then, the teams can then pull that work continuously you know, into the red part, that agile part of the value stream. Um, again, these, these enterprise and system views. Now, we actually think some of these will become less valuable as we get better because we don't want to have all these dependencies. If we do smaller bat sizes, if we do some of the, the design concepts of being able to dark launch and feature flags and things like that. But the reality is, you sort of have to implement, a, you know, kind of the strangler pattern where you're going from, you know, which is uh, came up. I I think uh, was it uh, Martin Fowler came up with this concept. I think of a tree being strangled by a, a vine, and it's really, you know, you can't really flash cut some of these capabilities. And you have to even today some of these tools that I've shown are replacing other tools. And as we move from this, you know, the vicious cycle to the smaller bat sizes, you need a way to uh, to phase that in by, you know, phasing out parts of the old way you did things, and then investing in the way the new ways you want to do things. You kind of have to bridge that chasm. So, so there's things we're doing today that you know we actually think. We would need less visibility, but we probably need more visibility on other things as we start to get better, right? So, so all this stuff around dependencies and impacts, you know, we're hoping that this will actually show that we're getting better. And then again, the whole idea of, of your status and your readiness status, um, you know, that move you through this. So again, the key a key concept though is not just the technology. As Mick said, it's around the lean thinking. Right, it, it's around you know. I would say the four P's: people, process, purpose, and problem solving. Right, and and that less variation is what actually allows you to apply automation effectively. Um, so, you know, there's kind of five five uh, final five thoughts here. 
I should also give a call out to Megan Kruger, who's our visual designer, who's helped us a lot in make, uh, making this uh, much better than some people. The one slide I got comments, uh, the Vision Circle slide, I actually got comments at the Teens Conference in uh, San Francisco this year that they thought that was the best slide of the conference. So if you have good material, then you don't have to lose for the speaker here. So uh, anyway. You know, it's about thinking horizontally, right? You actually want to think across the value stream, get out of your silos, get out of your own optimization. Um, you know, the next thing is around, again, local optimization is really the enemy of lean delivery. And it's not like these aren't good ideas, but they might not be the right time for them, right? If you start to chip away at your bottlenecks, then these things may become your bottleneck, and then is the time to attack them. But if you attack them prematurely, they actually, it'll look like a bad idea when really it was just bad timing of when you implement it. Um, you know, I think the next thing is around, again, automation requires patterns, patterns require the main variance. Said that a few times. Uh, the fourth one is, I should have it memorized. Again, I think going to what Mick talked about, right, technology is kind of the fun part, but if you don't get the culture right, it's really, you're not going to get that far. Um, you have, you really have to get the culture to go. And then you really can't manage things. You can't really go through that PDCA loop if you can't see it and you can't measure it, right? So it sounds simple, but, but many times, you know, we may have lots of metrics, but they may not actually be the metrics that shed the light on our value stream that will allow us to, to eliminate the barriers and eliminate waste that allow us to move more coordinated. So with that, I think that wraps it up. Okay, great. Thanks, Carmen and Nick. Uh, question that's rolled in here. What data are you sharing across each of the systems? So the data that we flow um, today is, you know, if you go back to that work intake, so it's things like um, we have approved work in Clarity that flows across into RTC to be initiatives and changes. So that flows from clarity. All our unplanned work, our defect work, flows from quality center uh, into, into the backlog of the agile teams. And that also flows into UCR. So when you're in UCR, you can actually see both you know, the, the application changes, the features, if you will, and you can also see the unplanned work in terms of the defects. And, you know, we're also looking at ways where you can take incidents that require resolution, turn them automatically into defects, and then turn those uh, into the backlog for your agile team to work on. And then from ServiceNow, there's a couple things. Really, ServiceNow is kind of at both ends of this. The operational work comes from ServiceNow, so we're looking at, we haven't built this yet, but building the integration of operational work. So these aren't things that necessarily require deployment, but they impact systems. They may be, you know, server changes or other th other changes that the systems still need to validate. And you want to see them in the same view that you're seeing, you know, the development work you're doing. The other part here is there's a lot of opportunity to automate things between continuous delivery and your ITSM processes. So things like automating your your request for change, right? If, if you're actually doing a readiness certification model, once you have that readiness, you should be able to generate, at that point, the request for change, have all the information and have it automatically approved because you've already given the visibility and, and don't get, that shouldn't be a manual cab kind of process. Today, it's very manual. Um, I think we see other opportunities here like with, you know, automatically updating your CIs and with config and knowledge. I mean, there's a lot of other, once you start to think this way, um, and you know, Mick has seen various patterns with various companies, you know, it starts to make you think about other things that you can automate. Again, understanding now that, that these are things in your way, anytime you, you know, there's two things that are always gonna have a target on their back to build a new value stream. One is anything that's manual, right? Can I automate this? And the second thing is anything where there's a request response, because a request response in an SLA guarantees some, some wait state. 
So anything, any time-based activities in your value stream are kind of targets of how can I make this self-service? How can I apply automation in order to eliminate those? Yeah, I think, you know, in terms of what we see in other organizations, it's exactly what Carmen said. It's once you make that diagram, it's the things that flow across your value stream, how quickly they flow, how long they get stuck, um, and, you know, basically the rates and volumes. In the end, you know, we care deeply about the velocity, right? What's our rate of business value delivery versus tech that takedown versus, you know, escape defect fixes and MTTR on those. That's kind of how we look at it. And so, you know, the yellow boxes here, those tend to be the things, right? Those are the, you know, the currencies around your software delivery that, that flow across your value stream. So, you know, just starting out with, again, I think what Carmen showed here is, you know, your, your lead time on bringing a new feature, but end to end, uh, those can be key, or mean time to resolution. So I think those, those are good places to start, and then it will help you zoom in on the right kind of metrics, um, a lot of which you'll get from the DevOps survey and such, so. I mean, anytime you, you do a lean activity, one of the first things that you're going to talk about is well, what's your work intake process. If you can't define your work intake process or you don't have a well-defined, you don't have a system of record, you know, you should be able to, from the Phoenix Project to answer those four questions, right? What are your four sources? Those are your four sources of work. Where do they come from? If they come from one place for each of those, you're ahead of the game. If they come from 27 different places with you know, different permutations, that's where you, you gotta start because if you don't have a good warranty intake process, then you, know, you really can't get too far downstream no matter you know how good you are. Um, you really aren't gonna be able to see that flow of work across your value stream and, and be effective at managing. Yeah, exactly. So I think I'd say just start here. The first diagram you make is about your standard work input and, and, and I would exactly, the next step, start, start here. And now, where do you where do you do capacity and demand planning for resources? Uh, is it RTC? Well, that's an interesting question. So, that's part of where I think we're going on the transformation, right? I think one of the key things that we changed was this concept of bringing the work to the projects, right? Bringing people to the work, and now we bring the work to the team. So, really, what you want to do is set up asset based, product based teams. Agile lines, you know, and then kind of the two pizza kind of concepts, and then bring the work to them. And if you're doing that, this whole concepts are very become much simpler, right? You basically decide how much do I want to invest in this product, and then you send them the high priority work. And so, what does what does capacity planning then mean? You know, it really means have I right sized this team based on the flow of work I'm going to give them, and that becomes very obvious in the team room. Right, if they're sitting around, or or how, how you know what your backlog looks like. So, so it's kind of an an intentional way of doing it. Now, we're we're transforming that from kind of the old way of, of clarity and allocations to to actually you know one that I think becomes much simpler in terms of um, flowing that work to the team and having kind of this concept of team allocation, if you will. But that's. That's where I think we're moving in the future in terms of you know planning is, and then the other thing is you know how much are your teams cross skilled right so that if you have an issue with one product you can you you know that you can set up you can take work from that line and send it to another line um, to handle. We have some areas that are very good at that. You know we have some one area for example that has four teams that are asset centric and then they have a fifth team that. The, the floating team. So they're able to take capacity wherever needed and they know how, you know, because they have consistent processes, consistent tools, it's not a big deal to move and take that overflow work if it if it hits any of those other four applications. So, you know, I I think what you've seen is traditionally areas like us have done very spent a lot of time in a tool like a Clarity, doing minute allocations around projects, moving away to setting up teams in RTC and flowing work to those teams and then investing them based on you know, the investment that you want to make in that product and the amount of work you want to flow to. So how do we define WIP limits? I assume that's work in progress and where are WIP limits managed? 
but for the agile team, the limits are obviously managing the team room. And that's, um, I think the harder problem is actually what I've seen teams not, what I see areas actually fail at now more than the delivery. I think they're better on delivery and using those concepts from in the team room of what your work in progress is going to be um, around continuous improvement activities. What I see is we don't apply these concepts to continuous improvement and we have way too much, and I'm not saying it's about nationwide, I'm saying it's in general in the industry, way too much continuous improvement work and you can't twist your value streams multiple ways simultaneously and run an experiment, right? So, so you know, I think, I think from a delivery perspective that the Agile team room, we're pretty good at managing the work in progress. We're actually been pretty good at saying, even from a continuous improvement, we're only going to allow, you know, we have a board set up that we apply this, this to um, for, for continuous improvement work. We're only going to have, you know, at most two continuous improvement items going at any one time. But, I, but again, I, I think you have to manage that, you know, both from delivery and also from process improvement. Otherwise, you know, you're going to run into the issue that the Phoenix Project did, where too much work in progress is going to come up the works. Well, I think that's going to be it, guys. Uh, any uh, last things you'd like to say before we wrap up today? I just want to underscore just one thing that Carmen said there, because I think you know once you're through the stage uh, and you start basically bringing work to teams, and you this this switch to the poll based mod model is 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 just it's amazing. We've done it now for about for more than half our teams at Tasktop, for example, and it's you know when you when work starts being pulled, which again is this goal of lean. Um, it's you know you end up with much much better throughput in the end. You know much happier developers, much happier IT staff, and so on. So I think that the, there's this really neat end goal that Carmen's alluding to that where Nationwide is actually uh, ending up right now, where you actually switch into that model. And it's no longer stressing so much about, uh, around you know, too many backlogs piling up, but, but teams pulling things in the most effective ways for them. And so I think there is this, this really neat nirvana state that we can all look forward to uh, once this stuff is in place. So. so with that said, the webinar is now concluded. Good, goodbye all and have a great weekend coming up. Take care. Thanks everyone.